This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the first video for Module 13. This module is on thermodynamics, or really more accurately, it's thermochemistry. And in this video, I want to talk a little bit about energy and then talk about the calculations that you will be doing for bond energy. Now, you already know from discussions earlier in this course, or perhaps even in a previous course, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. We've got the law of the conservation of energy. But energy can change forms, and it comes in many forms. We're most familiar with things like electrical energy or light energy. Um, but when we're talking in this class, we'll be thinking quite a bit about chemical energy. All Forms of energy can exist in a potential energy or a kinetic energy state. In potential energy, you have things stored, and in a kinetic energy state, there are energy is causing motion, and motion then causes work. So that chemical potential energy is found in the bonds between the atoms in molecules, and when those bonds are broken and the energy is released, then it changes into another type of kinetic energy and causes something to happen. What we're most concerned about in the chemical reactions that we'll be talking about in this module is what happens as bonds break and reform and how energy is absorbed and released in, as a net sum of the entire process. So here are some illustrations of two types of energy changes. If a person climbs to the top of the water slide here, they have a certain amount of potential energy because of the height above the ground. This is called gravitational potential energy. And then that energy, potential energy is changed into kinetic energy, kinetic energy of motion, as they go down the water slide and, and are letting themselves be drawn by gravity. <clears throat> there is both the motion of the person coming down the slide and because of some friction you will have a little bit of heat coming off. Heat is a byproduct of chemical or not chemical energy changes because it is a form of disorganized energy and so you typically will see heat every time you have got energy changing forms. On the right here we have an example of potential energy because of chemical bonding structure and this is the change from sugar molecules into carbon dioxide and water molecules as part of cellular respiration. Hopefully you remember that from biology that the Krebs cycle will take glucose and turn it into these byproducts of cellular respiration but in the process some energy is harvested and stored in ATP molecules. So this is energy that's more than just given off as heat. It's actually captured into molecules and then can be used someplace else like little batteries to power our bodies. When we're talking about energy, the fancy word we use for that is enthalpy. And enthalpy is, um, the symbol for that is an H, a capital H. It is an indication of the internal energy of a substance, but we can only measure things changing in enthalpy. We can't look at a substance and stick a probe in it and measure the enthalpy or measure the internal energy. We can measure the uh, measure of their internal kinetic energy because that's temperature, but of the total energy, both potential and kinetic, we just can't get a handle on it. We have to wait until something changes. When enthalpy changes, and energy is released. We have something that's known as an exothermic reaction. Heat is to released into the environment. And when we're talking about or indicating that in our formulas, it's a negative delta H. A negative change in enthalpy goes along with an exothermic reaction. Heat is being released. Or energy of all types. We usually see heat. And then on the flip side of that, when energy is being absorbed or heat is being absorbed, the substance is cooling down as it reacts, then you have an endothermic reaction, and it is a positive form for delta H. Heat always flows from the high to the low. So, you know, heat will move into a cooler substance, cool substance, the coolness does not move into the hot. So that when a exothermic reaction is going on and something feels warm, it's because heat is moving out of that reaction and into the exterior environment. And in an endothermic reaction, if something feels cool, it's because heat is being drawn into the environment or drawn in from the environment into the reaction. So if you put your hands on the beaker that's an exothermic reaction, it feels hot to you because that heat from the beaker is moving into your fingers as heat's flowing from high to low. 
and you put your hands on a beaker where an endothermic reaction is occurring, it'll feel cold or cool to you because the heat is being drawn out of your fingers into the beaker and so that your fingers are registering a cold change. Within any reaction, there is a uh, things happening, energy is being released and absorbed on both the reactants and the product side, but we can't see what's going on until it's all done. And then we look at the net energy change. So through a variety of processes that are beyond what we can do in this class, scientists have been able to come up with bond energies, an indication of how much energy is found in a bond between molecules. Because there's a certain amount of energy involved in the electrons circu circulating or orbiting, I guess, orbiting around the, the nucleus of the atoms in any particular molecule. Um, but it's, it's, you can't, as I said, you can't just measure the enthalpy, you can't measure the energy without having something change. And so through a series of experiments, we can get tables of bond energies, tables of measurements of how much energy is found in these individual bonds between different chemicals. And then we can use those numbers to predict whether a reaction will be exothermic or endothermic by calculating the change in enthalpy using the values from the bond energies. In order to do that, you need to add up all the energy it takes to break the bonds because the assumption is, is that in order to make this, if we kind of draw down below, we've got these hydrogens and chlorines as um, molecules, and we have the intermediate step where everything has been broken apart. They're no longer attached at all. They're all dissolved down into atoms, and then things reform. Now, whether that actually happens quite that way in a very concrete form uh, is probably a debatable. Uh, maybe with hydrogen forming hydrogen chloride gas, it would. But for some other substances, this sort of everybody detached free state may not be exactly true, but this is how we think about it. So we think about how much, and considering bond energies, we think about how much energy it would take to break apart every single bond on this side and then to make every single bond on the other side. And then what you end up is the net answer. So you have to sum the amount of energy it takes to break the bonds and sum the amount of energy it takes to make the bonds. And then you subtract the make total from the break total. So when you write the equation, you can think of it, because this is an equation you will have to memorize, but it is alphabetical. B comes before M, even though you're subtracting M from B. So as I said before, you need to assume that all the bonds are broken before reforming when you're doing these calculations, even if you think that's not exactly how it's going to work in real life. Here's another way of thinking about it. These diagrams, this picture is saying that, you know, at the bottom of this enthalpy area, uh, enthalpy arrow, this is a state of low energy, and up here is a state of higher energy. So our reactant molecules in this first equation are starting off at a low energy, and this much energy is involved in turning them into their freely separated atoms, and this much energy is involved in turning them back into at the whatever product we're going for in this reaction. And so since the product is at a higher energy state than the reactants, you see it's, it's um, higher up in the air, higher on the enthalpy arrow, then if you took, this was the amount of energy that it was to make the bonds, this is the amount of energy to break, so it would be this amount minus this amount, you're going to end up with a positive number, or this would be an endothermic reaction, because the products are having are at a higher energy state than the reactants. So they've got to get that energy from somewhere to be, end up at the extra energy state. These are the ones that will pull, you can feel them pulling the heat from the environment. And this reaction on the right is the opposite. Again, you're reactant molecules here, well, they're starting out in sort of a higher middle level of enthalpy, and this much energy is needed to break their bonds into atoms, and then this much energy is needed to make those bonds again to whatever products you're forming. The products are at a lower energy state, which means they've released all this energy to get to that lower energy state, and so this would be an exothermic reaction.
Here's an example using some actual numbers. These are taken from the charts that are in your textbook. But the single bonds between these hydrogen atoms has been calculated to be 432 kilojoules per mole. And the double bond here between these two oxygen molecules is 494 kilojoules per mole. Double bonds will always be more or contain more energy in them than single bonds, but it's not twice as much. And then each one of these hydrogen-oxygen bonds in water is 459 kilojoules per mole. And so in order to calculate the delta H or the change in enthalpy, for this reaction, where we take two molecules of hydrogen or two moles of hydrogen gas and mix with one mole of oxygen gas to make two moles of water, you would use the formula where you take the sum of the em energy to break the bonds, which would be 2 times the um, hydrogen bond amount, 432, plus the 494 for the double bond of oxygen. So you would add all of that together. And then you would subtract from that the amount that it takes to make the bonds. And since you've got four oxygen-hydrogen bonds involved here, it would be a four times the 459 kilojoules per mole. So if you do those calculations, you'll end up with a delta H of a negative 478 kilojoules per mole. That negative number tells you that this is an exothermic reaction, that when hydrogen gas is combined with oxygen gas to make water, liquid water, or water vapor at this point, it would be an, a reaction that releases heat into the environment. The delta H would be a negative number as an indication of an exothermic reaction. So this should get you started on this part of the chapter, get going on doing some of those bond energy calculations that are in the uh, practice problems.